my guys, I'm here to do a wrap up today. I'm sorry about the lighting. It's been like dark all day and I don't really feel like I have a choice. Um, I did film another video the other day in the actual evening thinking that might be better, but I don't know anymore, I give up. Anyway, in November, I had a pretty good reading month. I read a lot of non-fiction for non-fiction November. And then I actually think I read the fiction, the non-fiction I read, I pretty much loved all of it. But I was disappointed in quite a lot of the fiction that I read, which kind of sucks. Maybe I should have just kept to reading non-fiction for November. But I will quickly start with the audiobooks because they are, um, I mean, one's non-fiction, but two I were re-listens and they were the Wondersmith series, so into the Trials of Morrigan Crow, and then um, Wondersmith, The Calling of Morrigan Crow. They are from the Nevermore series, written by Jessica Townsend. They are middle grade fantasy books, which if you watch my channel probably seems a bit out of my wheelhouse but honestly I find them so so comforting and obviously post post JK Rowling post Harry Potter I don't um I don't re-listen to those very often anymore and honestly I just wanted to listen to something different I first read them a year ago I've actually only ever listened to them but I've read them in class with like children and love them so Morgan Crow is like a 12 year old girl who is a cursed child and she's whisked away to another part of her universe um there's actually some really interesting discussions about migration and refugees in it because morrigan crosses the border illegally um and then she participates in this competition to be part of something called the wondrous society which i guess is like a magical um group of individuals there's animals and humans and cats and vampires and all sorts but i just find it really soothing to listen to it's really really well narrated it's um like a full character cast and the voices are great and i really recommend it if you guys are feeling low or like you want some something soothing or alternatively you have children in your life and want to buy them books for christmas i can't recommend the wondersmith series more so that's the audiobook. And then I also listened to Gender Explorers by Juno Roche. And Juno Roche is quite a well-known trans activist. And they have put together a collection of interviews working with two different charities. One of which is Mermaids, which is like a huge trans charity in the UK. And the second, I can't remember off the top of my head. But they've collected together interviews. And I listened to this on audio because it's narrated um, in the interview style, which I found really helpful. And they interview children and then a lot of the children's families it ranges from eight-year-olds all the way up to uh, like children in their teens and um, their early 20s it was just super super enlightening to read about that as someone who educates children and spends a lot of time with children it's obviously really important to consider children who identify outside of the gender binary and i feel like listening to children talk about their experiences what they found really helpful in schools and from their families and what has really um stuck with them as like damaging experiences was extremely useful um but even if you're not someone who spends time with children or as an educator i feel like everyone could learn from this especially at the moment we're seeing such a hideous rise in transphobia and today as i'm filming we've just had more news with the um rolling back of some of the healthcare treatment that under 16 um people can have on the nhs that experience gender dysphoria which is pretty depressing i will link a couple of people down below to follow who talk about um trans rights in the uk really well one of which is juno dawson who's a um, writer and literary person but so yeah i can highly recommend that on audio i sent it to my um like peers at university and some of my lecturers but i feel like it's something that should definitely be on our initial teacher training curriculum um for anyone who yeah is working with kids because i feel like primary age children are forgotten when we talk about um being inclusive in our classrooms so yeah that's that and then the other book i listened to on audio but i have on in physical copy because i got it in the charity shop a few months ago is we need new stories challenging the toxic myths behind the age of discontent by nezra malik this book is that got straight out to my top five non-fiction of the year i've highlighted and underlined practically half of it and bought a copy to gift a friend so nezra malik is a sudanese british writer columnist she writes for the guardian and she's very involved in scholarship around gender equality and um that sort of thing so the book is divided into six different chapters each of which covers a myth something that is been planted in our society that we are led to believe is an issue or something that is proven and yet nezra malik is able to disprove them all as falsehood so she looks at gender equality and how we 
in the West, it's so obviously taken for granted that we have gender equality and there is no need for feminism. And then she reels out loads of examples as to why that's absolutely not the case. She makes some really interesting comparisons with Western feminism and coming from a Sudanese background, being schooled in Sudan, that experience. Um, then she talks about the, the myth of the free speech crisis, which I found really interesting. She quotes a lot of right wing and even centralist um, commentators and like political figures that we see in the paper and sort of discuss the Overton window and how we our politics in the UK at least has shifted so far to the right that some of these ideas are seen as extremely left wing and radical when in fact we're asking for something that was maybe even 10 years ago not considered that radical which I thought was really interesting but my favorite actually I think of the whole thing was where she talks about um, new myths for new stories and the idea that the popular media and the people that write in the newspapers are the ones that are perpetuating these myths and we need to refurb the way we produce and consume the news in order to have it as open and non-biased as it can be um, because she talks about obviously so much of the gatekeeping that goes on in the media there's some terrifying statistics about the number of schools and universities that um, all journalists in our current you know main five newspapers come from the um like gender difference in the and the obviously the race difference we have in our journalism fields and yeah i just i'm not talking very eloquently about this but i really really adored it i think it's a must read for anyone who's interested in non-fiction politics or just current societal issues um i would definitely recommend it and i would recommend it on audio actually because she narrates it beautifully should I just keep going with the non-fiction and then I might actually switch this into two, I might cut this into two videos because I feel like I have quite a lot to say today. Um, I finished Show Me Where It Hurts, Living With Invisible Illness by Kylie Malston. This was a book I featured on my channel last month and I spoke about it in um, a vlog, but I actually didn't wrap it up because I didn't finish it until like the very start of November. But I got this on Book Depository because Kylie Malston is an um, Australian author and this book has only been published by text publishing in Australia as of right now I would love 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 for it to be picked up and published in the UK as well as in the States because Kylie Nelson is talking about chronic pain chronic illness and conditions that um, I have and conditions that people I know have and it was so so galvanizing to read about that on paper she writes beautifully these are a collection of essays all about her experiences she's um, a few years older than me she's like in her late 30s and her how her life has been shaped by living with um chronic pain conditions and uh, like how her education has been shaped how her um dating the choice to have children all those things have been implicated in her journey she talks about workism and the idea of being productive as the main you know propellant for people to live their lives and how that interacts with you as someone who is a disabled person or someone who cannot be fully productive all the time and that was really interesting she made some really funny sort of like inside comments about people in the um invisible illness community like talking about the memes and talking about spongebob squarepants which i love some of them it's quite pop culture heavy so a lot of she references like a whole essay about a tv show that i hadn't seen it's like an australian tv show but i don't mind that in essays sometimes it's quite interesting she talks about the rental market the crisis of affordable housing for people who are disabled but honestly it was just so galvanizing to read about people living their lives with things that i deal with and um yeah i can't i can't thank kylie enough for writing this book honestly it really it really blew me away and it's something i would like aspire to write what one day myself i think it was it was it was so beautiful but yeah one i would um love everyone in my life to read on to more big hitter non-fiction that i loved um Whites and Other False on Race and Other False Buds by Otega Awagba. This is a tiny slim book put out by Fourth Estate. It's just one essay published by um I think it came out last month. I had it on pre-order and it arrived on the day and I read it um like in the course of a couple of hours. But um she's talking about the fallout from the George Floyd murder and the rise of the protests that we saw over the summer in the US and the UK and really is it possible to be a true ally as a white person to black people in this period of um social change that we're living through and this idea of 
uh, virtual signaling and um, click activism and participating online and what that actually means when you, you're not prepared to give up something that you have and the definition of allyship if allyship is is actually involves sacrifice and I don't and she is implying that a lot of a lot of people don't understand that and that's why they're not participating in allyship it was um damning obviously and extremely extremely important to read but I haven't quite like got my thoughts sorted on it yet but I can 100% recommend it to everyone um I almost feel weird recommending it she talks in here there's a really great page where she talks about the rise of the anti-racist reading list and what that actually did for people and what it what it sort of perpetuated this idea that you can just be well read in something and that's actually not enough that's the bare minimum and um the passivity of reading when you're not turning that reading into action into community work into societal change then what use is it to do the reading at all and that really really made me think a lot as someone who's like posted about anti-racist racist reading books and who's read a lot of them um it's just yeah food for thought on that one definitely okay i'm gonna go to some of the fiction because i feel like i've got a few duds to show with you crazy rich asians by Kevin kwan i spoke about this in my vlog if you haven't seen it i'll link the instagram post below this is a pile of shit um kevin kwan's racist i don't really have anything else to say on it don't read it don't buy it i now, now don't know what to do with it if anyone has any advice i don't really feel like giving it to the charity shop because i don't really want anyone else to like read it or like this to be circulated and i also have the other two because i bought them as a collection of three or my mum bought them for me um so yeah i don't have anything to say on the narrative because i don't want to read a book with the n word in it that's not written by a black person I read Julian by Halle Butler. I was disappointed. I loved The New Me by Halle Butler. I thought it was the sharpest take on workism and the perpetuation of productivity culture and burnout that I've ever read. But I think I loved it a lot because it was also one of the first... Maybe it wasn't the first millennial fiction I read because I read Sally Rooney, but I, there's, I can't think of anything in common with Halle Butler and Sally Rooney. Um, I almost shy away from considering Sally Rooney part of the millennial sphere because I feel like her books maybe it's because of the context of her books set in Ireland that I don't find them to have that many similarities but anyway I loved the new me and this was published before the new me so this was Butler's debut and it was fine it's about um a woman Megan or two women Megan and Gillian Megan lives in with her boyfriend is very unhappy and Gillian lives alone with her son and they both work in a doctor's office and it's sort of about how much Megan hates Gillian and despises her life and how much Gillian wants to be part of Megan's life and this weird infatuation she has with getting a dog. Um, and it's interesting to see Gillian sort of fall off of the, the, like, she basically just falls into sort of like a psychosis over and loses touch with reality over this period of like a few months and we sort of see that happen but then Megan is the most detestable character and I like unlikable characters but Megan is is vile just so self-hating or hating everyone else has not an ounce of hope in her body for the future of herself and her boyfriend is so nasty to her boyfriend um and the ending really threw me but yeah like three 2.5 wasn't that big a fan uh, Pizza Girl by Jean y Young Frazier. I picked this up because it was going around on Bookstagram a while ago. Um, it's very short, 170 pages, sort of plotless. Actually has quite a lot in common with Gillian. It's about a unnamed pregnant protagonist working in a pizza shop at a dead-on job with a boyfriend and her mum living at home and she gets infatuated with a local, like, woman who she drops off pizza to um and in the same way you do in Gillian you see this character put so much into this other person that they vaguely know and the other person has no connection with them and doesn't realize how much they are being idolized and pedestaled by your protagonist and again they start to lose touch with reality and it ends in this like act of insanity um but 
I th- I would say only into like a hundred pages was after a hundred pages I was not interested and I was like oh, I'll push for another ten and then suddenly it started to get interesting because the characters started to be- become more and more strange, um, but could take it or leave it again middle of the road. It was an interesting look at queerness um, and sexual identity and bisexuality, like being in a straight relationship and having feelings for other, for. Um, someone of the same sex as you, I found that interesting, but it wasn't enough to keep me gripped. I was incredibly, incredibly sad by the end for some reason though, but I don't know if I was just in a sad mood or if it was actually that sad. Um, oh, Jalen's gonna be disappointed. Daddy by Emma Klein. It was fine, like it wasn't, oh, it wasn't worth the 16 pounds I spent on the hardback, that's for sure. Um, so this is a collection of short stories by the writer of The Girls who wrote, um, Emma Klein wrote that. I want to say 2016, and that's about basically see on the Manson cult and the Sharon Tate murders in um, California in the 60s, I want to say. Um, and it's got a very like low level tension, cultish misdemeanor vibe to it, which I really liked. And coincidentally, my favorite story in here was the one that was it felt like it was based on the same background experience with the um, like commune and the group of girls and. Uh, them sort of sneaking around but ostensibly it's about horrible men all of these these men in these books in these stories are acting out of turn or acting towards women in a violent or inappropriate way but Emma Klein isn't really showing you that she's just leaving you the breadcrumbs she's a very very frustrating writer to read but I can understand that it is very clever to write in that way so we're hearing about something that happened in the past or the incident or the man is now like this is because of that night sort of thing but because they're short stories you never find out what that night is which um, me being the way I am my mind just like jumps to these places which is really interesting to read as a reader and I love to talk to people about the stories to find out where did they think he was a rapist did they think he was this did they think he was that um but I don't know, I think it's also quite forgettable. I read this at the start of the month and I'm now I'm like straining my brain to think about what I actually thought about it. Um, I love the one that was set and based on, I think Brandy Melville I mentioned in a vlog, um, the girl who like sells her used underwear. I thought that was really clever and obviously extremely seedy. But yeah, I don't know. I wasn't, I wasn't that enamored by it in the end which is disappointing, but I will pick up where the climb writes next, I think, and I'm hoping it will be a full length novel. I feel like maybe that's just more her jam. Okay, and the last fiction book I read, and by far the best fiction book I read this month was Open Water by Kayla Bazuma Nelson. Again, if you saw my vlog, I was raving about this. This is a proof from Viking. I was kindly sent. It comes out in February. I will leave the link to pre-order it below. Go and click on it now. This is the most beautiful story of two young black British uh, millennials living and working in between London and Dublin. They're both in the arts. One's a photographer, one's a dancer. Um, They fall in love. You follow, you, you trace their story of the slowest burn of love I've ever witnessed in a book. I was talking to my friends the other day about how much we all hate romance. This, I wouldn't even classify this as romance, but like this is so romantic as a book it's so romantic to read um you watch them fall in love so slowly and then other parts of their worlds come crashing down they're trying to make it work and slowly you realize that it's it's unfixable and it's so so sad um but azuma nelson is writing about priest brutality he's writing about intergenerational trauma he's writing about the scars that a black body carries he is a beautiful beautiful writer it's extremely lyrical I would compare it to Sahi Jones's memoir, um, How We Fight For Our Lives, and I would compare it to Ocean Vong's On Earth With Briefly Gorgeous, that sort of lyricism and poetic prose we're talking about. He plays with repetition a lot. He plays with just sort of like, it's the kind of book you want to read aloud. Like when you're reading it in your head, you're going with the rhythm of the book. He talks a lot about music, about pop culture, about books, um, our main character is really really into Zadie Smith and is a big reader um and yeah I just adored it it was so so beautiful I don't think it's going to be for everyone I would say it's potentially could some people would suggest that it's overwritten but I don't think anything can be overwritten for me to be honest when people say that I'm like oh they're the books I like um 
but yeah, I'm trying to um, find a paragraph. It's also written in second person, which I think is so um, evocative to read. Um, I'm going to read a paragraph because I feel like it's really hard to explain unless I read it, but I'm not very good at that. Golden hour swarms your senses, colour tears through the sky in haphazard strokes. Your hand is bleeding and you're sucking the spillage from your thumb. You try to open a bottle of cider with a key and the jag jagged edge sliced shallow through your skin. You've both been touched by heat and the alcohol, but it makes the meeting no less honest. Just order it, please, guys. It's so stunning, but really sad. But I really liked it. I wrote a review on it and I will post it down below as well. Okay, the last two non-fiction books I have, I also adored this month. I'm not sure. It's really hard to pick a favourite non-fiction for non-fiction November because I just read um, more of it than I do in any other month. But I read A Dutiful Boy. I actually listened to this on audio as well. I should have picked it up earlier by Moshin, Z Moshin Zaidi, um, who actually commented on my Instagram, guys, which was fantastic. Um, a memoir of a gay Muslim's journey to acceptance, so as the title sort of gives away. It's a story of Mohsin and his experiences growing up, coming to terms with his sexuality in a Shia Muslim community in London. Um, Mohsin ends up going to Oxford and is then, um, becomes a lawyer, which is really interesting. And he talks a lot about, once we move past the experience of his adolescence and his childhood, then when he talks about being a lawyer and sort of like fighting for lgbtq plus rights while still harboring sort of internalized homophobia and understanding that his parents haven't accepted him but he believes in the rights for everyone um and he's at the end of the day has lived up to what his parents wanted he talks a lot about the cultural expectations in his community and you know having a job that will contribute to your family household having a job that will, your parents will be proud of um that like sort of idea of the second generation immigrant which i've read a lot on before but i think that intersection with sexuality is, is extremely interesting to consider. Um, it's harrowing some parts of it, especially as Mohsin, Mohsin suffers with his mental health so badly, especially as he gets to university and is coming to terms with his sexuality there. Um, but it's a wonderful also representation of therapy and counselling and how that can help you, which I really always appreciate in memoirs of mental health to give a good representation to that. So that was great. Um, on audio, it's read by him, which obviously is fantastic as well but I think it's really clear the anguish and the angst that he experienced which obviously is gutting to read about and you're pleased that he made it out the other side but um it's not a it wasn't like a 180 flip and suddenly his family accepted him like it it was hard and it was long and he got to the point where his friends and his therapist were saying you have to realize maybe your parents will never accept you and I just can't imagine how gut-wrenchingly sad that must be um but yeah honestly i really really adored it i would really really recommend it as just another perspective on the intersection between sexuality and religion and the last book which needs no introduction i'm sure so many of you have read and this is just me participating in the hype for it because i don't think you can overhype this book and that is in the dream house by carmen maria machado this memoir is like nothing else I've ever read. So each section is written in a different genre of lit literary prose. So we've got, I'll read you some of the titles. The dream house is utopia. The dream house is a haiku. The dream house is a stop gap. My favorite is the dream house as a choose your own adventure story where um, Maria Machado lays out an experience of um, hers and asks you to skip to different pages depending on what you think will happen to her. And it, it was so cleverly done and I copied it and wrote my review in that same format, which was really fun. But um, it's if you haven't heard, it's a story of um, Machado's experience being in a lesbian relationship and experiencing domestic abuse and domestic violence. But she blends queer theory into her personal memoir to give this real oomph to the story and make her a really strong point that domestic violence in the LGBTQ plus community is not spoken about enough and that flattening of people's experiences is extremely damaging and extremely dangerous people are losing their lives because of that so she talks about like the myth of the lesbian utopia and this idea that people think or like first and second wave feminism believe that like lesbianism couldn't ever like intersect with violence because that was like 
without men, what possibly could go wrong sort of thing. And she really picks apart that argument. And I really appreciated that element as well as her being a fantastic writer. Um, she honestly just blew me away. It's obviously an extremely traumatic story and an extremely raw story for Machado to write. Um, and she's spoken a lot about since her experience of writing this, because I feel like quite often in the same way to a dutiful boy, people assume that putting your words and your experiences like this on paper is cathartic, when in fact it's obviously like reliving trauma all over again. I think that's important to consider when we talk about books like this. Um, but they're no less important for that. And I've picked up uh, her short story collection and I'm so, so, so excited to see what she writes again outside of this experience of her trauma because I think she obviously has so much more to give to the world, which is fantastic. <sighs> I'm out of breath. That is all the books I read in November. Um, I'm putting up my end of the year reading plans and then... We'll see where December takes us. So thank you so much for watching, guys. I'll get back to you soon with a new video. Bye.